Greetings, beautiful people. My name is Simon Javan Okelo. I am in Seattle, Washington at the Seattle Drum School in this beautiful space known as The Lab. This is where a lot of incredible events happen, not just uh, you know, in this specific location, um, but a lot of people, you know, a lot of artists from New York, from Kenya, have graced this space to rehearse and also to do small events. Uh, and today I'm really, really privileged to be with the CEO uh, and the founder of the Seattle Drum School, uh, Mr. Steve Smith, who is uh, an incredible leader in the music scene. He's a musician himself, uh, and he's also created uh, you know, an institution that has really helped a lot of musicians, including myself and mm. the Madaraka Festival community. All our rehearsals happen here, and uh, I just want to thank you for creating such a beautiful uh, brand and a home for many, many musicians and talents. Uh, uh, thank you. F I appreciate that. You know, just it's uh, it just sort of uh, started from nowhere and and kind of keeps keeps going. But I'm honored to be here on your on your show, being oh, interviewed by you, man. You've done some really and still are doing some amazing things for the world. Thank in my you. Opinion. Thank you so much. You know, uh, people who do the things that you've done also um, are risk takers, uh, and sometimes friends and family might even think that you've lost your mind <laughs> because you're taking a, a, a path that is very unusual, you know. Uh, here in Seattle, I was interviewing a guest uh, a few weeks ago where I was uh, sharing with him that if you are starting a business or uh, anything in Seattle, there is a lot of pressure for you to succeed because when you look around, this is where Boeing mm -hmm. was started. When you look the other side, this is where Microfo mm -hmm. Microsoft, Microsoft was started. When you look the other way, Ma Amazon was mm -hmm. started here. Uh, Maki, the, the, the audio brand, mm -hmm. uh, was started here. And many, many others, you know, and many, many other innovations have started in this region. And so, you know, in a world where America is a world where many people actually are just seeking to make so much money and to become so rich. But you, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you chose a path to, to heal people, to educate mm. people, uh, and to do something you love, really, you know. Absolutely. So take us back to how it, how it, you know, how, how you grew up in this part of the world. How was it growing up in Seattle? Well, I, I was born in, in Richland, Washington, which is southeastern Washington. Okay. Um, Tri-cities, three, three cities that sort of are, were all inter, intermingled. And, and I, I lived there for the first 18 years. And uh, growing up in Richland, I, I, um, my dad worked out at Hanford, which is like the, the nuclear plant out there. Oh. Um, and uh, I had a sort of a natural curiosity about physics and, and subatomic particle weirdness. Um, so I, I ended up doing a, a class um, in high school there called Inquiry into Science, where we would actually go to, go to school about an hour and a half in the morning, and then we would work out in these research facilities, these nuclear research facilities. So I, um, that's sort of what got me started thinking about rhythm and time and and uh, music actually because there's so so much so many parallels between music and and uh, matter um, anyway that was my earliest start and and uh, I had a chance a I worked out there for a year and they ended up hiring me full-time this nuclear research facility um, but then I had an opportunity because I'd always played drums right and I, I was invited to go on tour for a year with a pretty average cover band, but they were making 250 bucks a week in oh, 1975, wow. Wow. which for me was like crazy. And I get to go and play music every, you know, five, six nights a week. So I did that and uh, freaked my mother out. She was just <laughs> freaked out. My science teacher freaked out just about everyone you could imagine because, you know, how could I throw my life away like that? How old were you? At this I was 18. 18. 18. Okay. okay. And, uh, um, anyway, so I did that, and I thought, this is, you know, this is fun. I really love doing this. Maybe I, you know, but, and 
in addition to that, I had been teaching private music lessons. I just I started with this. Actually, was a um, the brother of one of the twin twin brothers who was two years younger than me, and uh, so I, I had started teaching when I was um, 16, maybe even 14 if you count the four-year-old that I played with. Um, but uh, so I'd always been teaching, and then uh, I had a chance to go on the road, and my mother always wanted me to uh, go back to school and get my degree so I could teach at a public school and have insurance right. and benefits. You know, right. that, was, that was her big dream for me, and, and uh, so, I promised her that I would only do it for a year and that I would save my money. And she was, you're not going to be able to save money. And, you know, but I, I did it and I saved $700 a month and uh, had enough money to, to pretty much pay for my first year of school. I went to a community college for, for one year and then transferred to uh, Central Washington University, which has a really powerful music program, jazz program, and, and everything, really. Um, so I went to school there and I would still... I would drive home every other week and teach lessons and then played in bands, horn bands, and, and uh, got my education there. And then uh, um, when I graduated, um, the, the director of the percussion program was also the director of the jazz program, John Mallet. He was a renowned, nationally recognized educator. And he was getting older, and um, they decided that they would, uh, well, they wanted me to do a master's there. so. They offered me a, a, a teaching assistantship where they would pay me for t 20 hours a week, and then I would also um, teach all the undergraduate percussion lessons there. So, um, so I did that and graduated two years later, and then, uh, of course, I'm still playing in you know rock bands and horn bands the whole time. Um, and then uh, I moved to Seattle and, uh, with a rock band, actually, and, and uh, um, did various whatever I needed to work at a music store for a very short amount of time. Um, and then ended up touring with another band for a year. Anyway, uh, so I, so I landed there and then, uh, I had to earn my way through college the rest of the way. So I was always working. My parents didn't have a bunch of money and I was sort of determined to just do it on my own anyway. Um, and, uh, Managed the band. The band needed a PA. I'd buy the PA if they needed the van for transportation. I'd I'd figure out a way to get a van, and if uh, you know we needed, um, of course we needed gigs. So I had to figure out how to book gigs because I needed to eat and pay my rent. Um, so I kind of started doing business, basically, when I was in college and uh, um, provided rehearsal space. And I would record the demos, which were like very low tech. I'd have a stereo tape deck, a, a TAC, a really nice one. And I'd have only two mics, you know, one for the left, one th to the right. And then I would just spend hours trying to figure out where to put those two mics in order to have the recording sound in stereo with, you know, get a balance and, and blend. And, and uh, so that's what kind of started the cultivation of my um, fascination with recording. Um, anyway, so finally, when I uh, moved to S Seattle, um, I still taught, and then uh, there was a music store. It was called Guitars Etc. Um, downtown at Seventh and Blanchard, that I worked at for a while, and then uh, I got fired because my van with all my gear in it broke down on a highway on 167 near Kent. <laughs> we just <laughs> re referred to that earlier. Yeah. Um, and I missed an eight o'clock sales meeting because I had to go and get my van off the side of the road with all my gear in it. And that was the best thing that ever happened to me getting fired from that gig. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I ended up that, that store actually collapsed. See that they learned their lesson there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, a couple of Asian guys, the Lee brothers bought it, turned it into a store called music world, same location, seventh and Blanchard. Um, and out in the parking lot, they had this little tiny parking, lot attendance office had been abandoned for years. It was about half the size of, of this stage, if that, and just big enough for me to put my, uh, my a drum set and my, my vibraphone. I had a set of vibes that I bought when I was in college. And uh, I asked them if I could teach out of that. And it was, there was no insulation. There was, you know, half inch cracks between the doors, um, uh, but it was just big enough. So I started right. teaching there and it was next to a music store. So I would just go there and practice all day and then people would hear me. And then I, I started to attract, um, students. Um, 
And then eventually, uh, um, uh, after about a couple of years, the space opened up in North Seattle that my, one of my students told me about that had, uh, um, it had heat. Mm. <laughs> and there was also a bathroom right down the hall, right. you know, and, and uh, so I went and looked at that and, and uh, that was like a, a, you know, a first class luxury suite to me. Mm. Um, so I, I met with the landlord and, and uh, talked him into letting me teach drums there. Um, that was uh, the original location up on 15th Avenue Northeast. So I had one room that was um, 12 by 12 um, and started teaching there. And, and then uh, um, one of my students wanted a, a place to teach, so I rented another room, and then he started in. And then it just kind of kept going. And the next thing I knew, there was these amazing local players that had heard or stopped by. And, and uh, eventually we took over the whole 8,300-square-foot space and then built a venue in the back called The Lab. <laughs> Oh, wow. Just original, like this. It was called, yeah, it was a little auditorium in the back. Mm. It was an acronym um, for that. And this is sort of, you know, we... Oh, a little auditorium in the back. Yeah. Okay. And it was actually about twice the size, more okay. than twice the size of this room, two and a half, three times the size of this. Okay. But it was a full-on recording studio, um, completely isolated with a separate control room and all the soundproofing and, and all the acoustic treatment. Um, sit, it could seat 125 people um and that's where we uh, started doing hundreds and hundreds of shows right back in the day and we recorded everything multi-track and wow. then would mix it and then uh um, we hosted i don't know countless um concerts um a local jim knapp orchestra played there for about seven years the first monday of every month um anyway it was um quite qu quite a thing and i had i had no idea where it would go when when I started it, I'm just like teaching people one at a time, and so there. That's my story f about that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if I yeah. talked to you off. Yeah. No. 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 <laughs> no. I, I was following all of it. So. Um, so. What year? What year was it that you got the you you got you got the landlord to allow you to start teaching drums at the. Uh, that North Seattle location. That was 1986. Okay, 1986. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I was 1985, clear. actually. Well, it was actually 1985. I didn't okay. start calling the, the school okay. until, until um, 1986. And 1987 was when I took on the every, – every little chunk I had add would be um, – exponentially larger than the first after the first couple of years and okay and then i when i added the, the 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 downstairs section of the front of the building we had another 14 1500 square feet and and that gave me permission to put a sign out front right and then uh that was when the the city of seattle discovered that i had a business and informed me that i needed to have a license yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so uh, that was when it, it, it you know legally um, became an, an entity. Yeah. 85. 1985. And it yeah. was 2007 was when we um, opened this space, which was once again a, you know, 6,000 square foot addition yeah. to the yeah to the thing. So you have two locations yeah. in Seattle. Okay. So, uh, uh, you know, I can only imagine how many challenges and how many, uh, how many times uh, you even considered quitting. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me one thing that happened in the course of how many years have you been running uh, this year? 30, 38. 38. 38. Share with me one story that made you feel like, okay, this is it. I'm walking away. <laughs> well, okay. In uh, 2007, um, the day that we opened this location, it was May 12th. We had a grand opening of the weekend of May 12th and May 13th. Mm. Um, the Economist we had the data uh, uh, literally traced the beginning of the great recession to that weekend mm. and that year like that literally to, to the, the the day that we opened this this space down here which cost us a fortune mm. you know we had to spend so much money and borrow so much money um and uh a year in 2009 it really hit in 2008 it started in 2007 but it, it really it really started to hurt in 2009. We got, uh, my landlord passed away, the dad, and then uh, his two daughters um, took over the, the lease. And 
and they, they were kind. They were great. But one of the, the older sister had a, a, a real estate attorney friend, and she was just trying to help them. But she convinced them that we weren't paying enough rent, and that after, t what, 26 years, 25 years that we were there? I can't remember now. A um, long time ago, we, we were there, many years, and that uh, we should pay a, a $2,000 damage deposit. And this is when enrollment was is plummeting. It was literally everyone was hurting and uh, raised our rent 25%, 24%. Wow. That's a, that was an unbelievable hit, not to mention the, hurt, the, 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 the pain. That, I mean, we, we met with them at a, at a uh, Subway you know, restaurant that was across the street from us just to have this, this meeting. And, and, and uh, we were just, I mean, Christy, my wife, and I were kind of in tears and, yeah. and just like absolutely you know, how could this be happening? Right. Um, and uh, the sisters were, <laughs> they were very emotionally wrapped up with this too. They, they were, they, you know, one of them passed away, but they're, they, they were very, very dear people to us and they always will be. Yeah. Uh, and they were just trying to do what, you know, people that run, operate a business in a commercial property in Seattle do. And the deal, the, what we were paying was still a great rate. You know, it wasn't unfair in terms of, commercial property but for us that kind of money we've we've uh, we've never been very money motivated and I, I just I you know I, I didn't have a lot of it when I was growing up I just I'm happy to have what what I need and you know and uh, blessed to be able to, to to what money I'm gonna spend on on stuff be able to put in an institution like this but what you know you still got to pay your rent you still got to eat that was that was that was probably the one of the, the, the roughest times, um, and it, it's always been kind of a challenge at this location to get um, people to come here for for lessons. It's just where's Georgetown? You know, right. I, I mean, I, I didn't really even know where it was. I knew that people would rehearse down here, mm -hmm. um, but then one of my students played a he, he did his wedding reception at Jules May's, you know, just you know half a mile from here. And I remember on my way down here, I took airport away from downtown Seattle, and I kept thinking, when is this going to end? You know, of course, now it's like a, you know, like this. Um, so it was a struggle in, when we opened this building during that recession. Right, right. And uh, um, it's, you know, we, there's, 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 uh, there's only 1,341 people that live in this general area, you know, and... and uh, um, we have all the statistics because we, we looked into that. We were, w when we moved into here, Georgetown was, and this is one of the reasons why we, we, we considered it, it was supposed to be the next Fremont, you know? Oh, wow. It was supposed to blow up, and there were um, these huge development programs slated for the area. One, uh, Sabi, some company, they, they were supposed to have a thousand workers right. working on some uh, some of these huge projects. And, and it's sort of a double-edged, well, it, I'm a double-edged sword, but we love this area. We don't really want it to change. It's just that if, if there were a few thousand more people living, you know, within a quarter mile of us, it would be a lot easier to, to uh, attract, you know, private students. That's just some people that's, you know, well, you know, I can get my peanut butter from this store or that store. Which one's closer, you know? And, right. And, you know, of course, our, our peanut butter costs us a lot more, and, and we think that we make the best <laughs> peanut butter. But... You know that one of the challenges for for you know for us is is to you, if they don't ever try what we have they don't know what they're not getting and and there's a there's a lot of great you know teachers in town it's just you know we uh we try and offer a lot more than well the best we pay a lot more than than all of our competitors i shouldn't say all of them but most of them for sure and uh we want the best people, and we want we want them to be well cared for, you know. And and right. uh, that's that, you know, that minimizes our our margin. And then when things dip the way they did during the recession, man, our you know our our income goes down to less than zero, you know. And we um, we've got uh, we've had to borrow a lot of money over the years, and we're in that kind of that situation now. But we always manage it. We always 
pay it back, and we have an unbelievably good credit rating, <laughs> you know, our FICO score. Right. But you still, you have to have this in order to borrow that. Yeah. Um, but uh, anyway, we we just did a showcase here on on Saturday, and, and every every time, every time we do that, the the the, the joy and the um, the faces on these these people, these little tiny kids, and these adults playing their first musical performance mm. of their life, you know, mm. and and seeing that and seeing the, the and, and the audience and the quality of the the, right. the passion that people have for what happens here is just it's just a, a one more little thing that just you know it's just like got to keep got to got to got to keep stop. it doing yeah. got to go you know yeah. and and uh, we've seen generations grow up here literally we you know i had i had the son the dad and the grandpa all taking lessons here at one point and i have these kids that that i taught even before we had a school here in monroe i would go to a music store every thursday for 13 years and then next thing you know i see this dad in here he's like this tall and then here's this little you know mini eric yeah he's bringing his son to seattle for lessons right. you know and right. and uh, those are the things that that really keep me attached to the purpose. Right. I um, love that. You know. You answered that be- and it was my next question but uh to add to it when you look at the Seattle music scene, you know, um who are some of the legends, you know, Aaron Jones rehearses here. Oh yeah. But uh, I know that there are certain musicians, certain bands that have have uh have walked these corridors of the Seattle Drum School. Uh, and also, um, you know, uh, uh, before the conversation, we were talking about how your life is like a web of connections mm-hmm. with incredible people in the community. You were mentioning Robert Lang Studios mm-hmm. earlier. I want you to also just reflect on some of the legendary names in the mm-hmm. Seattle. When you look back three decades, because you've been running this for yeah. three decades, who are some of the people that uh, you want to just speak to how they've also impacted the Seattle music scene the way you have <clears throat> well we've had we've had our, our fair share of of uh, I probably probably the best known um, person would be Jason McGurr who plays drums with with Death Cab for Cutie mm. um, you know world famous their pop band they played the key arena last time or not the key arena I'm so old uh, climate pledge arena last mm-hmm. time they were in town mm-hmm. um, they rehearsed at our school but before they before they they were big and then Jason had studied with me when when he was 18 till he was almost 20 wow. he would drive down from Bellingham every week um, for, for his lesson and then uh, we've we've raised kids here um, smoosh was a band of, of uh, these two two young girls um, who pretty much grew up at, at, at our school. And now Chloe, the drummer, I mean, they're both doing phenomenal things. They play with the L.A. Philharmonic. They, they, they had something to do with the, um, oh, gosh, what was the, what was some, some cartoon soundtrack. Anyway, um, and then Chloe, when she was 21 or 22, was a guest drummer on Late Night with Seth Meyers for the whole week. Wow, um, you know they have like Abel Laboreal. They have world famous drummers that, that that play on that. Um, and then uh, one of my longtime students, Bill Rieflin, played in a band, a bunch of bands. One of them is called like an industrial band called Ministry. This is back in the the early '90s. And then uh, he went on to work with Trent Reznor from uh, Nine Inch Nails. And then he played with REM for ten years. And the last three years of his life, he passed away recently from cancer. He played with King Crimson. And uh, he had been sharing the stuff from from my book that I'm that close to publishing oh. um, with uh, Bill Bruford and Pat Mostelotto from King Crimson. And they were loving it. And, and this is decades ago. Um, and uh, now they in the, their final stage of that band, they had three drummers. Bill was one of them and, and uh, um, amazing players. And, and you can almost trace... I've seen tra- transcriptions of the, th- the triple drum parts. You can mm. also, you can see that that influence. Um, we've had a bunch of uh, a bunch of kids from Roosevelt High School, Garfield. I just worked with with um, one of them privately full time last year, and then another one part time, and then all, all th- the whole rhythm section 
to prepare for their uh, essentially essential Ellington festival that they got into. Um, in, anyway, I've, you know they're they're amazing. One of my the, my student is now playing for a Simon Fraser University jazz band. You know, fifty thousand student school um, in the first jazz band and uh, his freshman year. I mean, those are those are the there's a, so many success stories. I mean, the, the famous yeah. people. There's more that I'm can't, that I'm not, it's not even coming to mind. Right. Um, right. But uh, th- th- I mean, the real th- the real stars are these these little kids that 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 walk in. Just you know, they're they're just like figuring out where they are and who they are and why they're here. And and uh, they come in and they're kind of nervous and and little apprehensive. You can sense a little bit of fear. It's a right. new place, new environment. And and then. By the time they walk out, man, that you know that the t- by the time they've been here for their third time, they 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 own the place, right, you know, right. and and we see them just, you know, unfold and and uh, and uh, you know, the, I mean, those they're the ones that uh, that I'm the most proud of, you yeah. know, those people and and the adults, the the you know, the mom that's always wanted to play drums you know and and i'm 45 i'm gonna do this you know and i say right <laughs> on you know and they're killer you yeah. know they love it they have you know those are those are the th- that's where the success is and when i see that these bands that have been spawned at our school we we used to rehearse these kids they were called capital basement they were all 12 and 13 year olds when they started and uh they would be rehearsed once a week as a band, and I taught the drummer, Cassia. Um, and then during the summer, we would do a, a camp, a six week, or six day, sorry, six day camp where we would rehearse the band for four days. They would, they're already writing their material, and then we'd spend the last two days recording it. And then we put out like a five song EP. And then, of course, I'd come back on Sunday and, and mix the whole thing. And uh, those kids, they're, they, you know, Cassia's doing live sound in front of the house like mega, you know, arenas or whatever, you know, maybe it's only the show box. But uh, anyway, they ended up winning the best unsigned band contest in Seattle oh, when wow. they were like f- 15 and 16 wow. year olds. Wow. And this, everybody's wanting to get that gig because you get to play at the Moore Theater for, you know, the, it was sponsored by a KZOK or KISW, one of those, you know, rock stations. Anyway, they, I mean, those are, you know, and those, those, people their 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 humanity is is just rich with with creativity and 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 confidence and and expressivity you know and that's they're not famous but they could be it's just a, as you know anyway that's that's a uh, that comes to mind yeah for sure i love that i love i, I love i just love th- these stories because the stories is really what makes uh the Seattle drum school what it is uh, I, I also just want to talk to you a little more about the, the support you've given me and the Madaraka Festival over the years. Uh, you know, we've, we've accessed the space. For mm-hmm. example, we are recording this podcast mm-hmm. courtesy of the support that you're giving us. Uh, and I know that your generosity is not unique to us. Mm-hmm. I feel like you've, you support so many other people in the community. Um, and I just wanted you to, to reflect on why you know, for example, helping me collect music instruments to send back to Africa is something that is important to you uh, and your team. Uh, you know, I know that you guys also don't even charge enough to keep your doors open, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so speak to why this attitude of service and giving is so important to you and your wife and your team. Um, I ju- I've always cared about um, people having a, a, a chance to succeed, you know, and that's why I've, I'm a teacher, you know, and and uh, part of my job as a teacher is to provide support in every area, emotional, um, inspiration, um, education, of course, and uh, but you know, people need opportunities to to. Uh, really explore their potential and and anything that we can offer and even if it if it's a affordable rehearsal affordable lessons we we've, we always try and keep our, our rates affordable and and if if people can't pay the full amount we always work with them we've 
we've helped you know raise kids that that uh, um, have nothing to speak of you know one of our one of our long time um, another success story this I, I won't mention her name for privacy but but she uh, her mom um, would stop by we had a bus stop right at front of our, our original building and and I would uh, she would I remember her coming in with this little little girl she was four and she asked us if if you know we had any kind of if she could get lessons and they had no money and, and I you know four is is really really young and and it's not necessarily when that would be you know money best spent you know she just needs you know especially if someone else is going to be teaching her like another teacher you know we've we provide lessons for a bunch of people and and i teach as many as i can or i you know if they want drum lessons but sometimes they want to learn something else and that means we, we're paying a teacher and then another teacher gets has to has to work with a four-year-old that's that's a tall order as a teacher anyway so i i told her you know what just keep stopping by but you know what play her all kinds of music get her just you know get her engaged with listening to music and and you know just tapping rhythm what way we doing just but keep stopping by and and then uh, when she they, they did they would get off the bus and they come in and that little girl was so delightful she was just just a, a little light and uh, so when she was six, I started teaching her mm. drums. And mm. then uh, soon, that, not long after that, my wife started teaching her voice. And then she'd be doing both drums and, and voice. You know, we're not charging them a penny. And it, it, uh, it feels good. You know, it's like, that's, why wouldn't I want to do that? I love kids. I love children. I, they're like, they're little miracles, you know. And, and uh, one, one, one day, I don't know, she was maybe... 10 by then we were uh we were uh, working on you know she was like i want to play the p piano <laughs> you know? so so i'm like teaching her these rhythms with her hands on the yeah. piano but making notes you know yeah. and then we would jam i get her doing some pattern i'd be jamming yeah. you know and yeah and then uh and then i had to i had to get up i'd go to the restroom or something and when i came back there was a the, the sheet of paper she put up there she she wrote I love this place with mm. a, with a big heart, you mm. know. And I'm like, there's oh. no, you can't put a dollar value on yeah. that. Yeah, you can't, you know. And no. and anyway, so cut to the chase. She uh, she uh, she's got a full scholarship at Lakeside mm. School, you know. Mm. Bill, I mean, she's doing amazing, and she's brilliant, you know. Mm. And and and. Uh, I don't know that. Uh, hopefully, we had a hand in, in with the encouragement and the the, the embracing mm -hmm. of her, mm -hmm. you know, early on. And turns out that uh, that her, you know, her, her, she and her mom were on welfare, and we never heard of the dad. We never saw the dad. And I said, "Well, what? what well, what, what's your dad do? Where, where is he?" he goes, "He's in prison." Mm. And then uh, it was, you know. How you know? And then, then uh, at one point, I asked her. So when do you, when do you think your dad's gonna gonna be out? She goes five years. <laughs> you know, mm. this girl spent most of her childhood without a dad, mm. and and it's like if we you know if, if, who wouldn't want to you know do something? I mean, I, the, the more the people like that, um, the better, in my yeah. opinion. Which is yeah. which is also one of the reasons why we really thought about trying to do stuff down here in Georgetown. It's, it's the South End. There's you know, there there's more need for for that kind of help down here, and and we want to we want to be able to provide you know in this area, and right. and we're trying to figure out a way to even do a lot more of that with the the nonprofit that my wife and I have 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 started, so that we can do more outreach. You know, it's it's one thing to have people come to us and ask if we have assistance, tuition assistance, which we do, it always have. Um, but it'd be another thing if we could really like have a f a serious fund that we can that we can we can uh, do outreach and 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 uh, utilize. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. I can talk to you for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we should probably we should we we will definitely be having you more. Uh, but I I want you to answer just one more question. Okay. I know you have to go and teach in a minute. And after you answer this question, I'll ask you to look at that camera and tell them uh, your name, 
and tell them to subscribe to the Madaraka Festival okay. podcast. But um, your dream, you know, because when you when, when you study this, I, I love your courage. Just the story of you being in that little room with your drums, with the mm -hmm. drums, and uh, you know you are building. And after you build something, people show up, and people have been showing up, and all these people you've talked about uh, that have benefited, some of whom have succeeded in many different ways, including the girl at Lakeside mm -hmm. that you spoke about. Uh, and I feel like these are little, these are there's a Kenyan musician who was mm -hmm. legendary. Uh, he plays the same traditional African music instrument I play called the Nyatiti. He passed on. Oh, his name sorry. was yeah. His name was Ayu Bogada. His music was played at the Olympics when the Olympics wow. were held in Brazil, you know. Wow. And uh, he was sickling towards the end of his life. And he was being interviewed for, I, I watched that interview a lot because I love his music. He's such an inspiration to me. Anyway, he was saying whenever he performs, whenever he plays, he, he leaves a portion of his soul mm. to the audience mm -hmm. and he, he, he gives a part of his life right. away, you know. And so he had, when he was, dying he had no regrets because he had given everything you know uh, that he could give you know and he felt that he was giving it to the right people uh -huh. you know and i feel like that's what you've done with your life you know all these people you've impacted you've given them a little bit of yourself and and it's just a good life i think you've lived a good life you've taken risks you've done a lot of wonderful things that make you happy but also uh, you know transform other people's lives so, but talk about the dream. You know, if you are to go back to the young uh, Steve Smith, uh, <laughs> what is the dream? Like, how would you like this space to look like? Um, you know, uh, like, what would the best Seattle drum school look like in your dreams? Um, I think it's, I think it, it looks, like it looks now is, is visually, um, I would just like everything to be um, reaching farther. I, you know, I, I, I would like to someday. I want it to succeed. I want it. To, I want there. I want it to carry on after after me. After I can't do that anymore, and I, I want people to be. Um, I want the people who work here to be as comfortable as possible. I want everyone to to have financial. Um, comfort and and um, confidence, um, and uh, I would love it if if we could bring a lot more people who can't afford music lessons in general um, to be able to come here and be uh, supported and nurtured and and, and uplifted. You know, my my wife and I we when we talk about what we're doing and why we're doing it and and you know wh who are we what are we you know i you know we've been doing this forever and and uh you know why we can't just go to europe for a couple of weeks and come back and you know i mean we I, we can and we just whatever you know w um we would uh i guess just be able to to, to reach farther and uh help more people and be able to afford it comfortably um without worrying about, you know, whether or not uh, we may have to sell our house someday, you know, to, to yeah. retire, you know, and yeah. I don't really see retiring. I, you know, I, I think my vision of, of, of I, mean, I, I pity the student during that lesson, but if I had a heart attack while I was teaching or playing a gig, you know, that might be the, the way I would describe going out with a bang, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I just, because I, I, I yeah. just I don't, can't imagine not not doing you know what I'm doing you know I mean I've never yeah. I've never you know thought of myself as 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 being a businessman I just you know one of my best all time Halloween costumes was when I I decided because it, you know I would show up and I got, went to the thrift store and bought a suit you know right and then I I slicked my hair back and then uh, went into to, went into the school right. And I'm thinking I'm being all clever and all this. And then there's some little teenager there, maybe 12, 13, you know, just kind of doing his thing. You know, we just, we just like, hey, man, he's just being cool. And he, he's sitting in the lobby. And, and I walk in and go, you like my costume? And he goes, sure. <laughs> you know? And I go, 
And they go, so what am I? He goes, businessman. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, I would like to, to uh, I just wanted to, to continue. Yeah. After I'm after I'm gone and be uh, and successfully and yeah. have everybody taken w- good care of, yeah. you know, students, teachers, staff, management, um, facilities. It'd be nice if we could buy one of our buildings. Yeah. That's kind of that's kind of a big challenge right now is is uh, our North uh, Lake City building is uh, they're going to be selling it in a couple of years. And he would love it if we could buy it. Right. Um but uh, he's gonna sell it, and, right. and we're we still got, you know, when this current lease is done, we still have five years left, um, paying on the money we we borrowed to build that warehouse out. Okay. You know, so that's a that's that's a, a challenge, but we're working on it. Yeah, man. Uh, for me, I I just appreciate you for everything you've done to the music uh, scene in Seattle. Seattle is a strong a uh, hub of some of the most incredible musicians in the world. Mm, I agree. And the Seattle Drum School has contributed significantly mm. to that. Uh, I was at NAM, you know, uh, recently, the NAM convention, the mm-hmm. biggest music convention in the world. I, I ran into a lot of musicians that I've run into here, <laughs> you know. Uh, and one of the bands that really killed it at one of the NAM performances were people that I've met here, you know. <laughs> So everything yeah. you're talking about, the dreams you're dreaming about are already happening, you know? And uh, I am definitely mm-hmm. a beneficiary of, you know, your efforts uh, and my community, the band, uh, one, my band, the One Vibe Band is a big beneficiary. So we deeply, deeply appreciate it. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. Glad that we can help in, in any yeah. way, yeah. for sure. Thank you. Um, so look at that camera. Okay. And uh, just say your name and encourage everybody who is watching to okay. subscribe to Madaraka Festival podcast. All right, listen up. Okay. Uh, my name is, is Steve C. Smith. When, I, when my book comes out, I have to differentiate myself from the drummer for Journey, Steve C. Smith. And uh, I encourage you to subscribe to the Madaraka Festival um, and support everything that's happening with respect to that. Thank you. Thank you so right. much. My pleasure. And uh, for those for who have been watching, uh, my conversation has been with the CEO and the co-founder of the Seattle Drum School, one of the biggest institutions that uh, nurtures and develops musicians. You know, whether you want to learn drumming, whether you want to learn guitar, vocal classes, piano, this is the place where you need to be. This is also the place where we are recording the Madaraka Festival podcast. Our band, the One Vibe Band, is also rehearsing here every week. So uh, make sure you go in the description of today's video so that you can get the website of the Seattle Drum School and you can come and learn something new. Uh, You know, one of the things that fascinated me about uh, my conversation with uh, Steve Smith today was really how he started. And I feel like all of you can, can start just the way he started. But before we finish, I just want to get three tips from you. Uh, I know you host a lot of events. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've been to so many events as a musician, as an attendee, and also maybe even as, a, as an organizer. A lot of people who are watching today's conversation are also people who are event producers, mm-hmm. artists. Uh, share three tips when it comes to events. What are some of the things that uh, somebody needs to think about to ensure their event is successful? Um, Show everybody involved respect, and uh, prove to them that you uh, well that you care, and and uh, hire someone who's really really good at it to help facilitate all, I this, love all this stuff. I and love yeah, hire the best people. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I love and it. and take take good care of them the best that you can. I love it. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you for, having for your me. time. Of course. Yeah. Okay.